So we're going to be talking about sedation case studies. Now, procedural sedation is something we do all the time in the emergency department. And we do it for lots of different reasons. So what are some different things? I'm an interactive kind of speaker here. So what are some different things that we sedate for in the department? Reduction is really common. What else? What's that? Patients annoying him. <laughs> it's not on my list. <laughs> but I could add it. OK, what else? We do for lots of stuff, right? Cardioversion, maybe a complicated procedure, laceration repair. And the goals every time we do it, we're trying to minimize pain for the patient, minimize the patient's level of anxiety and our own level of anxiety dealing with the patient, uh, maximize the amount of amnesia that we give them. We want to make sure that we maintain their cardiovascular and respiratory status, right? We don't want to take a patient who's awake, alert, talking to you, give them a medication and have them crump right in front of you and it's your fault. Create a safe environment for the patient and the provider and reach the perfect place in the spectrum. And this concept of the sedation spectrum is extremely important because without this concept, this would be a really, really easy lecture to give. Because the truth is that it's not like we have a patient, we know we want to do a procedure, we push a drug, that particular amount of drug works exactly the same on every patient, they all react the exact same way, and they all go into a nice deep level of sedation, we can do the procedure. That's just not how it works. Patients aren't like a light switch, right? Everybody responds differently to different medications. They all have different pros and cons. So we're dealing with more of a spectrum. And the anesthesiologists call this spectrum the sedation spectrum. And it goes from light sedation, which is like, eh, I'm just a little bit sleepy. That's probably about 20 to 25% of the people in this room right now, to moderate sedation, which is getting closer to what we want. This is where you really kind of have to jab them for a while. Like, hey, come on, buddy, wake up, before they start to get up and look at you. That's probably another 10% of the people in this room. Uh, and then you go deep sedation, which is kind of where we are looking for, where really it takes quite a bit of stimulation to wake these people up. And the last step on that spectrum is general anesthesia. And the definition of general anesthesia is loss of an airway. Right? That is the only difference between really deep sedation and general anesthesia from a definitional point of view. And that's never where we want to be, right? intubating somebody who's sedated. So I have listed here in my little notes sort of my dream drug. What characteristics would it have? And people can always add things to this list, but it would be an analgesic. It would provide complete amnesia, an anxiolytic, control their behavior reach the perfect level in the spectrum, like we said. It'd be easy to dose. That'd be nice, right? An adult comes in, X drug, 100 milligrams. Kid comes in, 100 milligrams. Same dose for everybody. That'd be nice. You could give it in multiple routes. You didn't have to worry about starting an IV. You can give this thing IM, PO, intranasal, lots of different ways to give it. You could give it in all age groups. You could give it to pregnant patients. It'd be quick on, quick off. It would have no adverse effects at all, maintain their blood pressure, maintain their respiratory rate. And the physicians would like it. The patients would like it. The nurses would like it. Everybody would like it. Right? That's the perfect sedation drug. Does the perfect sedation drug exist? Absolutely not. Right? So then what we're faced with is a decision of exactly what pros and cons, what trade-offs we're willing to make to sedate this patient safely and effectively. And I have listed here some cases, but we don't really need to go through them. There are more to get, those of you who read the brochure in advance, raise your hands. Yeah, right. Even if one person raised their hand, I wouldn't believe you. Um, so these are just three cases kind of just get you thinking had you read it in advance. Like, oh, young guy comes in, new onset AFib, what kinds of things might you want to use? Two-year-old kid comes in, nasty facial laceration from a dog bite. What kinds of sedation agents are you thinking about there? And if they're different, why are they different? And the third case would be 78-year-old female, multiple medical problems, fractured dislocation of the hip, bad CHF, already hypoxic. What kind of sedation agent would you be thinking about in her, if anything at all? Which is a critically important distinction, right? Some people are just not right for procedural sedation in the emergency department. Okay. So let's start to tackle some of the abstracts here. So question, question number one, ketamine, do the pros outweigh the cons and is the adverse event profile different in adults? So just so we all remember, ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic. We usually give this at about one milligram, perhaps up to two milligrams per kilogram IV. 
If you're going to give it IM, you need to at least double the dose, so four to five milligrams IM. Uh, and it functions as a dissociative anesthetic. And the easiest way to think about that and the easiest way to explain it to patients is that it takes everything that's going on here and dissociates it from everything that's going on down here. And this is a nice way to explain it to especially parents because we're using it a lot on kids. And say, hey, you know, Tommy may look at his arm that we're trying to make reduce. He may look like he's like having pain or feeling something, but he isn't. His brain is completely incapable of processing any of the signals that are coming forward, and that's a nice way to explain it. Some of the problems with ketamine is that it is a sympathomimetic, so there are certain patients in whom you want to be careful, and bad coronary artery disease is probably the biggest one. A little careful in those patients. There's this theoretical risk of increased intracranial pressure. There's lots of literature saying that that's completely bogus. That's not true. And in fact, it may decrease intracranial pressure. Uh, but it certainly will increase your blood pressure. There's no doubt about that. Can cause laryngospasm. That's never fun when it happens. Can cause emesis, but that usually happens after the sedation is over. Um, there's this whole issue of emergence reactions, which we'll get into, and then hypersalivation just a little bit. So the first two abstracts in this chapter actually deal with the frequency of the emergence phenomenon. So in the first abstract, number one, what is the nature of the emergence phenomenon using intravenous or intramuscular ketamine? This is a really big Australian observational case series. So it's 750 approximately consecutive sedations that reminds us that, okay, the dogma is that ketamine is going to cause some sort of horrible nightmare with like a wolf ripping out your insides or something, but the truth is it will cause you to dream. And those dreams are just as likely, if not more likely, to be pleasant dreams and good dreams than they are bad dreams if you set up the environment correctly. So in this particular study, they report that almost half the kids said, this was great. I had really great dreams. They had really pleasant hallucinations. They enjoyed their ketamine experience. Only 2% of the kids out of these 750s, so we're talking about you know, four or five kids, had some kind of combative behavior when they were coming out of the ketamine, and none of them needed a med to settle them down. And if you had to give them a med, what would it be? Some kind of benzodiazepine, probably, but none of them needed them. But one thing this study did, which I really like, and it's the first study I've seen that ever did this, because you know, I've been lecturing on sedation for years now. This is a topic of interest of mine. And I've always heard that, you know, these kids get ketamine, even if they have a relatively pleasant experience in the emergency department, for weeks afterwards, these kids are having nightmares or bad dreams or something like that. And this is one of the few studies I've seen where they followed the kids out for two to three weeks and then said, hey, have your dreams changed? Have you had nightmares? Have you had anything? And they found no kids reported increased bad dreams, nightmares, et cetera, after they went home. So that's one thing that this abstract gives that's a little bit unique. Uh, and the second one, Pretty similar, except it's a huge meta-analysis, 87 studies, 70,000 adults, and they were looking here for emergence reactions. And what they found were emergence reactions were very rare. When they occur, they can be treated quickly, safely, and effectively. And the best way to prevent an emergence reaction is to do what? That's the one, the calm environment, to really set up what I like to call the happy place. Right? Tell them to go to their happy place. Ask them what they like. What do you like to do? Where's your favorite place to be? Think pleasant thoughts. That actually works, right? You don't need to go so far as like candles and aromatherapy and music and things like that, although it's not the worst idea. Um, but that actually works. And I can only remember one time in my career where I thought this was going to backfire on me. Uh, and this is when I was up in San Francisco, and it was a kid who had a fracture of his arm, and orthopedics was coming down, and they said, Oh, you know, we need a little sedation for the kid. I said, no problem, we use some ketamine, you already had an IV, this is easy. So I sort of did my usual thing. But let me preface this by saying the kid was weird, for sure, right? He's one of those kids who just looked at me disapprovingly from the word go. You know, he's like about six or seven years old. He didn't look like he trust me. You know, the nurse was putting in his IV. He didn't look, he was like kind of scowling. He didn't say anything. And that's what should have tipped me off that this could maybe know not the way I want it to go. So, it doesn't matter though, he's quiet, he's not complaining, right, so he's not bothering us, we like that. So uh, the nurse pushes the ketamine, and I'm like, hey, I'm like, hey, Tommy, uh, you know, I'm like, so you're going to get a medication, you're going to dream, uh, I'm like, you know, what's your, uh, what's your favorite thing to eat? I don't have a favorite thing to eat. 
And he's like kind of getting madder. I'm like, okay, um, that's fine. Well, uh, you know, who's your favorite cartoon character? I don't have a favorite cartoon character. Okay, I'm like, uh, what's your favorite sports team? Or what's your favorite sport? I don't like sports. Right, and he's like getting more and more sleepy, and I'm like kind of running out of ideas, because I don't have kids. I don't know what five-year-olds like, particularly. Like, I'm out now. I'm like, uh, who's your favorite political figure? You know? <laughs> I don't even know what to say at this point. And he's getting sleepier and sleepier. So then I say, well, I'm like grasping at straws. Nobody's helping me. People are laughing at me. And I'm like, uh, he's like, ah, oh, he's almost out. And I'm like, what's your favorite movie? Do you have a favorite movie? I do. And for the first second, I see like a little bit of light out of this kid's eyes. I'm like, nailed it, right as he's about to go to sleep. Well, what's your favorite movie? Predator. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes out. <laughs> Yeah, that really happened, actually. Uh, the kid ended up doing fine. But um, in that same line, so abstract number three is what someone else on this side mentioned, which is the pretreatment. Uh, my personal belief is that giving ketamine to adults is totally fine. I have not had that many bad emergency reactions. Maybe I'm just a lucky guy. Maybe I'm just good at making them happy. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, remember that people are using this thing all over the world, intramuscularly in the jungles. They're using ketamine to do amputations and stuff like that. Nobody's all that worried about emergency reactions, but for those of you who are non-believers, either because of personal experience or things you've heard secondhand or just not enough experience with it, this abstract is for you. So this abstract number three, which is in the Annals of Emergency Medicine from February 2011, uh, is a prospective double-blind placebo-controlled trial of 182 patients where they're basically looking at pre-treating patients with uh, midazolam or Versed in order to see if this can reduce recovery agitation in adults. This was a two by two trial, so they got IV or IM ketamine along with Versed or no Versed or midazolam or no midazolam. Uh, and basically what they found, now their definition of emergency reaction or agitation recovery was kind of weird, but it was 25% when they didn't give midazolam and 8% when they did. So it decreased it pretty significantly. Again, my personal experience says that significant emergency reactions are really quite rare, to be honest. And these people were like, ah, eh, they moved their arm funny. You had an emergency reaction. They were like pretty judgy about who got it. Um, but that being said, I can't argue with this last statistic, was then they asked them afterwards, how satisfied were you with the sedation? The patients who got the Versed were 21% more likely to be satisfied than those who did not. So I can't argue with that one. So if you're nervous about using it in adults, I would suggest maybe starting out with like the gateway, give a little benzodiazepine first, and then eventually you'll probably move to just straight ketamine. Um, so the next two abstracts are just kind of like, well, is there anything else to worry about with ketamine? Uh, about talking specifically about vomiting and adverse respiratory effects. Abstract number four is a meta-analysis of 32 studies, 8,000 kids, and they're basically saying what characteristics of kid are more or less likely to make them have vomiting and recovery agitation. And what they found was that, kind of surprisingly, it's more of the adolescents who tend to have vomiting than it is the little, little kids, which is good. That's sort of good news for us because we're more nervous about sedating the little kids and that the, both of the adverse effects, the recovery agitation and the vomiting, were dose-related. So the more dose of ketamine you gave, the more likely you were to have a little bit of vomiting. But it always occurred, like I said before, after the sedation had already worn off. Uh, and number five is a very similar paper, but looking at patients getting oral procedures, and they found basically similar results, that higher doses had more uh, recovery agitation. Okay. Uh, we'll do the next question quickly. Is there a role for pretreatment with atropine when using ketamine for procedural sedation? Is anybody routinely using atropine pretreatment? Nobody is, then we can skip this section unless people just didn't want to raise their hand. But that's basically right. Uh, number six and seven are kind of saying the same thing. They're observational studies. They looked at thousands of kids and basically only found one case where there may have been some hypersalivation that caused a transient airway issue, but the child did not need to be intubated. But I want to make it very clear that in these abstracts, and we're particularly talking about atropine here, we're talking about preventing hypersalivation which I think we don't need to do, and that's different than if we're talking about preventing bradycardia. 
right? Like when you're giving RSI to a patient, that's a very different situation where the atropine is not for the salivation, it's for bradycardia. And in that case, it is still recommended for kids less than one year old to at least have it at the bedside to prevent this bradycardia. Okay, so the next question, just how safe is propofol? So how many people here are using propofol in their emergency department? So almost everybody, it's interesting, because like I said, I've been giving sedation lectures for years, and uh, as the years go by, every single year, there's more and more people who are using propofol, but we literally had to like rip this out of the hands of anesthesiologists, right? Like greedy anesthesiologists who wanted to keep this magical drug for themselves. Uh, so it is a sedative hypnotic. Um, you guys use it a lot, so you know a lot about it probably. I want to give you a few things you may not know. One is that the emulsion that it's in, that white stuff, contains both soy and egg. So patients who have either soy allergy or egg allergy are a little bit more likely to develop propotension -induced hypo, uh, propofol induced hypotension than those who do not. So just something to think about when you're choosing your agent. Um, abstracts eight and nine are looking at safety. These are huge meta-analyses, 25,000 patients, and number nine is 50,000 patients who got propofol, and basically they're saying the same thing. Adverse events, including hypotension, apnea, <clears throat> severe respiratory depression, very, very rare, extremely rare, and they're almost all transient. They resolve before you can do anything about it because the half-life of propofol is just so short. Uh, so question number nine starts to get into some new stuff. What is Ketafol and how does it compare to each agent on its own? So who has used, who's heard of Ketafol? Almost everybody, who's used it? Like five or six people, and what's your experience been generally? Good, 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 right? That's a, people mostly probably talk about Ketafol and you're like, how is it? You're like, pretty good, you know? It doesn't seem to be like amazing, it doesn't seem to be like this panacea, but everybody who's used it seems to like it, at least in a general sense. So ketafol is actually like kind of a trendy buzz term, but it means two different things. There are two different ways to give ketafol. The first is to take 0.5 milligrams per kilogram of ketamine, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram of propofol, so just a half dose of each one of the two agents for a total dose of one milligram per kilogram, mix them in the same syringe, and then put that in as much as you need for a total drug dose starting of one milligram per kilogram. The second way to give ketafol, second definition of the same drug, is to give a dose of 0.5 milligrams per kilogram of ketamine up front and then bolus the propofol separately, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram at a time. And the advocates of the second way of doing it say, a little bit easier to do it that way, and there's just no point in redosing the ketamine because the half-life of ketamine is closer to 10, 15 minutes, at least the duration of action is. So why are we giving that every three minutes? Really, it's just the propofol that we need to keep rebolusing. So both define ketafol. Uh, the people who are in the pro camp of ketafol say you get a smoother sedation. You might mitigate some of these adverse uh, events of either the drugs used in isolation, like a little less hypotension, a little less emergency reaction, et cetera. And the people, and there are smart people on both sides of this argument of ketafol. And the people who say ketafol is a waste of time mainly say, ah, it's two drugs instead of one. It's more work for my nurses. I get confused with the doses. You know, the whole point of sedation is to try to come up with one drug. It's going to work really well. Propofol works fine on its own. Ketamine at half dose is doing very little than just replacing fentanyl. So that's people who are in the con camp. Um, so let's go through some of these abstracts here. I know we're, I'm like already over time, but I started late, so that's okay. Uh, the first one, this is an abstract. It's older. I actually wrote this paper in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine in 2008, and this was just a review of the Ketafol articles that were written at that time. There were only six at the time, so it's a pretty easy paper to write. Uh, and they generally said that they were small studies. We need bigger stuff, but people seem to like it. This was more of a Mikey likes it kind of review. Now, number 11 uh, is by Gary and Alfato. Does anybody know Gary or have worked with him or heard him lecture? He's a great guy. He's the guy who coined the term ketafol. He's the man, right? I call him the godfather. He loves that name. He talks about it all the time when he emails me. Uh, he also came up with another really cool thing recently. I don't know if Mike talked about this yesterday. He talked to you about Inca, intranasal ketamine analgesia. 
So it's, a new, it's like a new term. You're going to start to hear that like you did Ketafol. And he's like, I came up with a new one. He emailed me a few weeks ago and told me that. So uh, this study here was the first big study in the emergency department looking at Ketafol, almost 250 adults. What they found here was they were looking for a difference in respiratory depression. They're saying, I hope we see less respiratory depression when using Ketafol. They didn't find that, but they did describe fewer peaks and valleys during the sedation. They used a funky sedation scale to see at every moment in time kind of how sedated the patient was. And there were less peaks and valleys when they used Ketafol. And also they found very high levels of satisfaction. They asked like everybody under the sun and it seemed like they really enjoyed the Ketafol experience. Uh, abstract number 12 is comparing ketamine with Ketafol. Uh, and what they found here, that procedural success was just about the same, 96% in the Ketafol group versus 100% in the ketamine group. The sedation time was a little bit shorter when using Ketafol, uh, three minutes versus, um, excuse me, 13 minutes versus 16 minutes, so just a little bit shorter. Uh, but all satisfaction scores much higher with Ketafol than with ketamine alone. Uh, and abstract number 13 uh, is an RCT comparing propofol with Ketafol. This one included kids and adults, about 200 patients. Uh, they, this is one of the few studies published out there that uses the second method of Ketafol administration, which I described, which was everybody got 0.5 milligrams per kilogram of ketamine up front, and then all of the rebolusing was done with just propofol. Uh, but they also found extremely high satisfaction use, et cetera, et cetera. And they concluded via another sedation score, there was better sedation quality with the Ketafol. One interesting thing about this study, and makes you think about how hard it is to do clinical research, so this was a blinded trial, right? So the physicians didn't know what the patient got, but they were comparing propofol versus ketafol. So half the patients had some level of ketamine in their system and half the patients didn't. So what do you think they did to keep the physicians blinded? Because you're going to know it, right? If somebody got ketamine, it's not that subtle to look at them and see that they got ketamine. They put sunglasses on all the patients to cover their eyes. Isn't that cool? Let's see just how hard it is to use, do clinical research. Um, do I have time? I have like five, ten minutes left still. That's fine. I have to tell you about my first Ketafol experience, not my personal experience, but with a patient, because it's totally hysterical. So uh, you know, I had I'd read about it, and I talked to Gary, and I wanted to try it. Uh, and I had this kid who came in. This is back when we were in the old hospital in USC. This is probably, like, uh, I'd say, at least six or seven years ago. Uh, kid, very normal 27-year-old kid, super mellow. He needed some minor procedure. I don't even remember what the procedure was. We knew it was only going to take a couple minutes. I talked to him a little bit just to feel him out and wanted anything to go wrong. He's like, yeah, no problem. I'm like, yeah, there's a new thing I've been reading about. It's a new combination of drugs. He's like, yeah, let's do it. You know, whatever. So uh, you give this kid the Ketafol, and I went through my usual spiel, you know, think happy thoughts, have a good dream, et cetera, et cetera. And so he gets the procedure. Everything goes fine. I still remember looking at the monitor, watching the blood pressure, watching the sat and going, wow, like, maybe I'm a believer. It looked like amazing. Everything just stayed exactly where it was supposed to be. Uh, and then the kid starts to wake up. And I'm like, uh, hey, you know, hey, uh, how was it? How was it? Nods his head. I'm like, OK. Uh, I'm like, well, uh, you know, was, was it a pleasant experience? Did you dream? Did you dream? Uh, he's like, sort of. And I'm like, oh, OK. Uh, he's like, well, I saw something. OK, you know. Uh, and mind you, this is not the normal sedation, right? This is, I'm on faculty for probably two to three years there. Uh, and I'm trying something new, and so I'd sort of call a few, like an idiot. I'd call a few, I'm like, oh, my chair is around, let's get him in here and see if he wants to watch this. And the charge nurse and some other people. Uh, and he's like, yeah, I saw something. I'm like, oh, what'd you see? Well, I saw God. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> and ev like I said, everybody is there. I don't know if you guys ever had a chance to visit the old hospital. There actually is, like, above where we do the sedations and stuff, like bench bleacher seating where people can, like, look down and see what you're doing if we were doing, like, a thoracotomy or something. And the stadium was full, right? That's the level of, like, scrutiny I'm getting here. So um, you saw God. I saw God. Well, did God say something to you? <laughs> he did. And I'm like, well, what did he say? You know? And for a split second, I'm sort of like, maybe I'm about to hear what God has to say to me. <laughs> like, I'm not sure. And he says, well, God walked up to me, 
and he handed me a joint. <laughs> and he said, smoke this. And I said, well, what'd you do? And he said, well, I looked at him and said, God, I don't do drugs. <laughs> so the kid turned down the joint from God. <laughs> All right, I can tell by the crowd at the back now that I'm getting close to overtime. So uh, any updates on midazolam? We can go through this pretty quick. This is not a new drug. Probably most of you have heard of midazolam before. All they're doing here is they're trying to say, is there any other way we can get this into a person's body? Say, so try like putting it in the cheek, putting it up the nose, et cetera, a bunch of different things. You're going to start to hear more about this. These are pretty recent papers. Bottom line is, it doesn't work very well. In fact, in one of these studies where they gave them intranasal ketamine, 20, or excuse me, intranasal uh, midazolam, 20% of the kids, so one out of five, had essentially no sedation at all going into their procedure. So uh, definitely, it's not ready for prime time. Uh, and the last question here is looking at end tidal CO2 monitoring. How many people are using end tidal CO2 monitoring with your sedation? Not very many. Do you do it because you like it or because you have to do it? Have to. That's what most people say. So this is a classic tree falls in the forest kind of situation with nobody around to hear it. Right? We have this end tidal CO2 monitor and proponents say, well, we'll know earlier if they potentially may be getting into some hypoxic respiratory distress state. Right? Uh, and that is true, and that's what the literature says. But that being said, the vast majority of the time, I think it just causes a lot of noise and commotion for no reason. Because you see the end tidal CO2 going up a little bit, and it's like one more thing to freak out about and worry about and beeping on the monitor. In reality, nothing happens. It resolves quickly, usually. So there isn't a lot of evidence. In fact, there's no evidence to say that it makes a clinical difference. Um, Abstract number 17, which is the last abstract, is basically just saying, answering the question, which we already know the answer to, and this is particularly relevant for those of you working in more rural situations, can a single ED provider give propofol by themselves? Right? Or do we need to do this 2MD thing that sort of was preached at the beginning? The answer is no, we don't. A single provider can do this safely. We have thousands of patients of experience with this, et cetera. I want to end with one thing, just because this is hot off the presses. It's not in the abstract. It's not in the chapter. And it's really important. It's an ASEP policy statement on procedural sedation and analgesia that just came out a couple of months ago. Uh, and this is the first one they've introduced in almost 10 years. And it has some very important changes in it that you need to be aware of. And I can discuss them with you at the back at the end if you want. There's three. Number one is fasting. So the official ASEP policy statement says no more fasting required before procedural sedation in the emergency department. So none of this two to six hours stuff, they have officially gone to the empty mouth, not empty stomach policy. That's really important. Uh, thing number two, end tidal CO2 monitoring. They say officially there's been no evidence to say this makes a clinical difference. We don't need to do end tidal CO2 monitoring anymore. Uh, and then number three, we just touched on, which is personnel. There's never been shown to be evidence that two physician sedation is any safer than one. So three really important updates that aren't in here. Now, I'm not saying you should go out and start doing all these things. You still have to follow your hospital policy. But at least know that if you decide you want to be the guy who fights some of this stuff, we have a little bit of evidence now and an official clinical policy saying we don't need to do these things anymore. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention, and I'll see you guys at the panel.